Good morning. Happy Sunday. Thanks for coming to worship with us. Welcome to Denver United. So excited that this morning, um, my mom is here with us. Judy Brendel. This is my mom. Would you mind standing so they can see you? It's been a number of years. And uh, what Rice had just said, I would echo, I would duplicate that I am um, serving Jesus and, and probably alive and, and certainly functional because my mom prayed for me and does still. Um, and uh, I've shared with you how the, the decline in my dad's health over the last few years has been challenging for our family. There's nobody that felt that more than she and... Um, I just, uh, you know, it, it's really cool at, at a season of middle age to be able to look at your parent as a hero, but the way that mom has um, given care to my dad through the end of his life um, at, at great personal sacrifice to include that she hasn't been here to visit us in like five years because he just wasn't able, um, I think is, is a, a beautiful picture of the gospel. And so just honor you. So such a, a delight to have you here rather than on the other side of the camera, which is, is somehow a little more normalizing. I, I'm, my mom filter is regulated when I'm looking at you versus when I'm having to remember that you're on the other side of that. <laughs> We're talking about the Jesus way this month. I was reminded as I was thinking of the text we're going to look at today of the time in my early adult life, actually I was halfway through my college years, that as I've shared with you before, I spent a summer in East Africa and it was absolutely formative for my ministry calling. It was the time in which or the context against which I sensed God's calling to me uh, to ministry and away from the things that I thought I would do. Very clear, it was unmistakable, and by God's grace, I never looked back. That summer, I spent eight weeks in Kenya, most of them shadowing a, a wonderful man of God, a pastor there who took me under his wing. And the, there were many lessons of that season of life, and I've shared from that from time to time over the years with you. I was reminded of the probably three weeks between when I got out of school and I flew to Africa to start that trip. And maybe it was being with you, Mom, that made me think about it, but we had a, a packing list to prepare for, and it was shockingly simple and small. I had two sets of clothes. You remember we went to like Goodwill or some sort of secondhand store and, and got not, not nice and nondescript clothes. They were intentionally supposed to be not expensive and not flashy. We weren't trying to highlight our American uh, wealth and style and things like that, but just simply um, um, blend in or not be the point. And um, so I remember turning my nose up a little bit at, at the clothes that we got. And as the date drew nearer and I was reckoning with what this was going to be, it started to, um, to become a challenge for me. So there was no electronics. And admittedly, electronics were, this was a simpler age with regard to what that means. You know, there were no phones, no cell phones at the time. Any of you who are 40 or over have the experience where your kid refers to the time when the phone was attached to the wall as the olden days. Like, that's not the olden days. The olden days are like horse and buggy. That was the 1980s. But to them, it's the olden days. So this, I suppose, was the olden days because there were no cell phones. But there were like Game Boys, Walkmans. Remember, brother, you had a Walkman. Rock the headphones. You remember the, um, like the little uh, football game that you'd play and they'd kick the little ball back and forth? None of that stuff. You couldn't bring it. That's what you'd do on the plane normally. Um, and so I was like, wow, what am I going to do without that stuff? Uh, we literally had a Bible, maybe a book, and two sets of clothes and a little backpack, and that was it. And I think as the date uh, drew near and the time came and we actually went, what I experienced, I didn't know to call it this at the time, but I think what, what I experienced was a crisis of simplicity, a crisis of simplicity. Anyone ever go through anything like that? where maybe you spent time in a developing world country, maybe you were in some mountain uh, experience where you leave everything that's the touch points of our life 
behind, but where you've faced a crisis of not having the things to do and to think about that we normally hang our life on, our hands and our heart and our minds. Our subject this morning is the crisis of simplicity. We're in Matthew chapter 8 as we continue in our search through the Gospels for the Jesus way. Scripture records Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I think we traditionally in the evangelical mindset understand way to mean the means to an end. I am the path by which you will find your destination of eternal life. And so we've turned, we've weaponized the way of Jesus. We've turned it into one more religious formula. You have to do this and say that in in order to go to heaven. Maybe he was getting at that, but I think Eugene Peterson, as we talked about two weeks ago, might have gotten to a, a, a more transcendent truth around this saying. The Jesus way wedded to the Jesus truth, brings about the Jesus life. And it seems that we as American evangelical Christians have paid disproportionate attention to the Jesus truth, but we've expressed it or or understood it through the prism of our way, our culture's way, the world's way, the American way, perhaps, the way of modern Western civilization. But the Jesus truth done our way leads to a very different life. It's the Jesus way, not way as a means to an end, but way understood as an end unto itself, the way of life which Jesus modeled. And then his truth added to that, that brings about the Jesus life. So we're in search of the Jesus way. Unfortunately, there aren't passages where he's like, listen up, everybody, here is my way. He teaches and we can derive his truth and he'll express the ideas that underpin his way. But really, you get his way by walking with him, by observing his life, by a hundred days in the life and then deducing from that his way and then piecing together a tapestry, sort of a mosaic of how Jesus lived his life. We're in Matthew chapter 18 this morning, and this is where we'll camp out. In verse 14, the word of God says, when Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. And that evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command and healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers of religious law said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. But the son of man, the son of man has no place even to lay his head. Another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me now and let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. We're going to look at this text this morning as sort of day in the life text. It's one of those bridge or connector passages. It's black letters, not red letters. These aren't the teachings of Jesus. He doesn't do anything seminal in this moment. It's kind of a connector between mountain peaks and easy to sort of cruise past. But I think it's in the average, ordinary peanut butter and jelly days of Jesus that we can extract some really important things about his ways. And so we're going to look at this passage in an expository way. Expository is trying to understand the scripture for all it's worth. Reading the scripture with an eye toward spiritual vibrance, yes, but also intellectual honesty. By the way, isn't it wonderful that Jesus didn't make us choose? Church makes us choose, doesn't it? Too often, famously, church makes us choose either all on fire for Jesus, but if we're honest, over time, it feels like I'm supposed to check my brain at the door. Or, you know, let's dig into the word and have a steak. Like the, I want to come to church because you feed me, pastor crowd, right? And then we do that. We really study it, but we end up studying it like it's a, a text. And like this is Bible class rather than interacting with the living God. And it can become somewhat spiritually dry. Jesus came full of grace and truth. And so Jesus didn't make us choose, right? As intellectually honest and spiritually vibrant students of Scripture and followers of the Savior, let's look at this passage this way. Here's what the expository 
approach to Scripture asks. Three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? And then what does it mean to me, to us, here now in 21st century Denver and beyond? And so if you're going to like Miss Pegg's expository Bible study class, then you're learning how to study the scripture this way for all it's worth with context, understanding the differences of literary genre and things like that. Hermeneutics, understanding the Bible in light of the, the confusing passages, in light of what the clearer passage, passages unmistakably teach. With that objective, we're just going to dig into this passage. OIA, observation, interpretation and application. First observation, what does it say? Second interpretation, what does it mean? And then third application, what does that mean for us? Okay, let me offer a couple of observations on this, our text. First, Jesus' pace is lived out and on display. Last week, Pastor Daniel did a fantastic job of teaching us about Jesus' seminal way, his pace that he didn't, and markedly so, snap to the grid of the world's pace, but he lived counterculturally. And here you see it. Jesus' ways are going to be woven in and out, so they're not likely to be discreet in one passage. You see this one reverberate. He healed all the sick. He went all out. He rolled up his sleeves. He worked hard. He was probably exhausted by the end of the day, just like we are when we have given everything we got at work. And then just when the crowd started to mass and swell beyond the confines of the house and everything of our way, the American way, the human way of advancement and increase would say, hey, get a bigger venue, bring a tent and set it up in the field. We're having revival. We're going to capitalize on this popularity. Jesus instead instructed his disciples, get the boat ready. We're going to the other side of the lake. He went all in and then he stopped. His pace is on display. Second, his way of, you could call it his way of obscurity, is foreshadowed. He teases one or demonstrates one that we're going to look at in a couple of weeks. And that is the way you could call it the way of obscurity. Jesus eschewed. He, he turned his back on upward mobility and instead chose to be a person of downward mobility. He didn't aspire he wasn't ambitious. When he saw the crowd, you know, not the sick and the, the, um, the people who had brought their demon-possessed friends, but the crowd that was gathering, this was the temptation of the devil. Remember in Matthew 4 a couple of weeks ago? Do something spectacular. Fast forward to the part where they're like, wow, he's so awesome. And instead, Jesus saw the crowd and he's like, I'm good. If this is the Jesus who inexplicably walked away when they tried to make him king by force. We'll get to that later. His persistent invitation, the invitation to follow me, is inferred here, implied in the, the man's response, I'll follow you wherever you go, is the fact that Jesus has said and said and said again, follow me. He said to the fishermen on the shore, follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. He said to Levi in the tax collector's booth, follow me and be my disciple. Follow me, follow me. Would you follow me? Follow me and I'll show you the way to God. I'll show you how to be and not just how to do. And so it's inferred because of the man's response and because of the context of Jesus having said it so many times in the last couple of chapters and then again to the man afterward who says, I'll follow you, but first, and he's like, no, just follow me. So that's implied, right? Okay, the next observation is that there is insight. It is instructive who it is that responded to him. His would-be follower that guy's identity is, in, is important. It says, one of the teachers of religious law said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. So tuck that away because we're going to come back to that. Jesus' response, lastly, as is so often the case, is unexpected. He doesn't do what you expect him to do. He doesn't say what they expect him to say. He's been saying, follow me, follow me. Would you follow me? And the guy's like, hey, I'll follow you. I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus is like, yeah, but the foxes have 
holes and the birds have nests. I, I don't have anywhere to sleep. What are you saying? You don't want me to follow you? You've been saying, follow me, and now I'm saying, I'll follow you. And it seems that Jesus is saying, no, nah, actually, maybe you shouldn't. What's he getting at here? All these observations culminate in the one that I think leads us down the path that this passage invites us to walk and reveals something important about Jesus' way. Notice that he held out his lifestyle, his vagabond lifestyle to the very guy who was living at large. He didn't say, no, you can't follow me, but he highlighted his homelessness to the guy with the nicest house on the block. He was a teacher of religious law. You're like, really? When did they get nice houses? (laughs) In that day, first century Palestine in Jewish territory, it was, the culture was all about theocracy. The hierarchy was established by uh, religious superiority. So you've, have you noticed in the gospels as you're reading them, often it says the Pharisees and teachers of religious law. Have you noticed those two are, are Pharisees and scribes in some translations? So you got your, think of it like a Venn diagram, your bigger circle of Pharisees. Who are the top? They're the upper class. Anyway, they're the ones who are like excited about God, religion, understanding the word of God, prophecy, the expectation of the Messiah. And they've studied, they're they're respected and wealthy. And then an inner circle within that outer circle of superiority are the scribes or the teachers of religious law. They don't just do the law with exceptional care and intentionality. They're the ones promulgating it, teaching others how to be like this. So these are the upper class in Jesus' society. With their position, just as the case in every societal hierarchy, comes wealth, prestige, honor, significance, Jesus, such that he says elsewhere, you Pharisees, you're so used to being greeted with these honor, honorifics. You, you love being honored. You, you expect the best seat at the banquet because they're given it. That's, what, that's the way it goes down with them. Jesus is well aware of who it was who was offering to follow him. So you have this crowd listening to him. They're in Galilee. It's primarily fishermen farmers, working class, salt of the earth folks, but you've evidently got one at least, probably a small group of, of upper crust people. And everybody in the, in the room knows who they are. And they're wearing expensive clothes. He talks about their flowing garb, you know, their, their long garments and, and fancy ornaments and things like that. And that guy says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And to him, Jesus says, Yeah, man, but that's good. But I have nowhere to lay my head, literally. You good with that? And the reason he says it is he knows this guy. Maybe he's doing his God thing where he can like see into their hearts and perceive what they're thinking. Or maybe he's just lived for 30 years and he knows that this guy's stuff has got him on a short string. This guy's life is the strings are being pulled by his big house and his expensive clothes and his lotions and potions and two baths a day and his servants and all the niceties in his life. He's managing all of his stuff and all of his expectations to which life has taught him and he is accepted to which he is entitled. And so Jesus says into the middle of this guy, you can follow me. I want you to follow me. You can't follow me like that. That stuff can't keep running your driving your train. Not gonna work. He presents, he introduces, perhaps causes on purpose for this wealthy aristocratic figure, a crisis of simplicity. What do you do with yourself? What do you do with your hands if you don't have a phone neurotically to pick up subconsciously if you have a spare discretionary 20 seconds and scroll through and look at something? 
What do you do without that? What do you do if you, if you don't have your house to fix up and, you know, the, the appliances to tear out and put in bigger or fancier appliances? Or if you don't have your clothes to evaluate against what people are wearing who are posting uh, and then getting new clothes. If you don't have that stuff to think about, if you don't have that stuff to, to order your private world, what do you do with yourself? That's the crisis Jesus is causing for this dude. To follow Jesus isn't merely to go the route he's taking. He makes very clear that he's not saying, follow me from point A to point B. He's saying, emulate my ways, observe my lifestyle, and do likewise. And Jesus' way, Jesus' way was marked by a trust-filled surrender to the Father, by a simple, focused totality. And he says, if you want to follow me, bro, you got to follow me. Even if that means you don't have a place to lay your head. You good with that? In Matthew 10, just a couple of chapters later, Jesus takes this growing pool of followers whom he calls disciples, and from them, he appoints 12 as apostles. Remember this? And he sends them out, it tells us in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5. And then it says he sends them out with these instructions, peculiar instructions. Sometimes you read this, has anyone read the Jesus sending out the disciples and the instructions? And you're like, ah, this might be like culturally contextualized or whatever. It probably made sense to them then. I think this was just as weird for them as it is for us. He sends them out, it says in verse eight, and tells them this, don't take a change of clothes. Don't take money or extra shoes. And they're like, huh? That's not culturally normal. He said, don't even carry a bag. Just go. What was his point? This is a Going out and witnessing is already hard. Trying to make it even harder? Do you want me to have to demonstrate how religious and committed I am? Is homelessness or poverty the point? Is that what I need to do to show you I really am all in? Clearly the home isn't the thing. You know, he says, I don't have a home. But if that were what righteousness would look like, he would have taught many things differently. He had just concluded his Sermon on the Mount in chapter seven of Matthew by talking about how a wise man builds his house on the what? On the rock. And a foolish man builds his house on the sand. And his point was, if you're gonna build your house, you wanna make sure and build it on something solid. But it's presumed that building a house is functional, good, or at least necessary. If it was otherwise, he would have been like, a, a, a foolish man tries to build a house. But a wise man recognizes that the son of man has no place to lay his head. It wouldn't lay his head anywhere either. If you really had faith, you wouldn't build a house at all. He doesn't say that. In fact, later on in the quizzical instructions after sending the disciples out, he tells them, hey, when you enter a house, accept their hospitality and let the peace of God through you rest on that house. Bless that house. He didn't say it. When you enter a house, tell them, you obviously don't love God because you got a house. The house isn't the point. Homelessness isn't his goal. Is Jesus irresponsible? Is he saying, if you want to follow God, practice reckless, irresponsible living in the name of Christianity? I mean, we've seen every generation explore that, you know, doing stuff half-heartedly and then blaming it on God. Anyone ever been hesitant to, to hire the professional or the contractor or the tradesman who has the fish logo because you're like... I hate that I feel that, but I don't want them to like love Jesus and suck (laughs) at plumbing or accounting or whatever. Anyone ever like wondered how sadly that stigma probably doesn't exist for no reason? And how if we in the church can't help but sense it, what do they think? He's not saying be irresponsible or foolish or don't do it with all your heart. He said if If you go to build a house or a tower or whatever you build, count the cost, think it through, plan, be wise. None of that is his point. So what is his point? Is it to pretend that 
the stuff that obviously matters doesn't matter. Remember in Matthew 6, when he gives the teaching on the, the, your, what you eat and what you drink and what you wear, he says, don't worry about that stuff. And he concludes it by saying, your heavenly father knows you need it. He doesn't say, hey, if you really loved me, you, you would realize you don't need that stuff. It's a foregone conclusion. It's a matter of course. Your father knows you need it. He says, don't run after that stuff and be all hung up and preoccupied by it. The pagans do that. Your heavenly father knows you need these things. The home's not the point. Poverty is not the point. Simplicity. I think that's the point. And for us, it is a crisis. Have you noticed in your reading, in the, has anyone been reading the Gospels with the Jesus way glasses on? Have you noticed Jesus' life was shockingly uncluttered? Shocking. I mean, if anybody would come to town with like the, the 10 totes or, or like um, foot lockers full of stuff, like when the Queen of England visits, you know, and they have wagons to carry all of her stuff, it would be the guy who is in very nature God and left heaven. Heaven only knows what he's used to. What's the royal treatment there like? And he's coming slumming with us on earth and even he, he lived shockingly uncluttered. So I've been um, recently turned on to a new serial novel action hero. Um, your friend and mine, Lucy, our children's pastor, heard me lamenting that my geeky spy novel hero, I've caught up. And so the, the books come out once a year. And so I was waiting for the next book to come out. And she said, you should try my, mine. So I tried her book series. And so the guy's name is Jack Reacher. Anybody read any Jack Reacher novels? So here's the thing about Jack Reacher. He, he's, got, he's, this, he's got all the superpowers. He's an amazing fighter and he's amazingly virtuous and selfless, but he lives like a nomad. Like he lives in cheap motels for two or three nights at a time. He literally had, just has the clothes on his back and when then they get dirty, he throws them away and buys other cheap clothes. And the only possession he carries is this, this sad little plastic toothbrush. That, it's like a portable toothbrush that folds. And, and there's one book I, I got fed up because finally like, he loses it. He snaps and goes berserk and kills all the bad guys because they broke his folding toothbrush. Do you remember this one, Kathy? They broke his folding toothbrush. He's like, all right, that's it. And he goes blitzkrieg. And I was talking to Lucy. I'm, she's like, how are you liking Jack Reacher? And I'm like, I'm kind of love hating him. Like he's a stud and everything, but like, it's so lame. I mean, it's so unrealistic. And, and like, who lives that way? He literally doesn't have a home. He goes from one motel to the next. He's only got the clothes on his back and this one folding toothbrush. I'm like, I like everything about him except that. Who lives that way? Hey, hey, as I am about to go back to preparing this message. <laughs> it's like, wow, I need this way. It was more than that Jesus just had a minimalist personality. This was Jesus's way. He chose carefully the way that he would live, his lifestyle. He could have lived any way he chose. And he chose to live shockingly uncluttered. He gives, I think, the theological basis for this at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount, which is itself the ideological base, the largest concentrated portion of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels. And then his life goes on to demonstrate, to live out examples of his ideas. He begins that Sermon on the Mount with the so-called Beatitudes, you know, blessed are these and blessed are those. He pronounces blessings. And he says, in the most obscure Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He does two things. He acknowledges first that there are two kingdoms. There's a reality of the kingdom of this world, which has a way. We are discipled, if you will. We're steeped in the way of the world from birth. You know, I, I heard a, a, a satirist giving a TED talk. He says a new fish is dropped into a fish tank and says to the guy that's been living there, hey, how's the water? And the other fish says, what the heck's water? 
right? It's all we've ever known, the American way. We were marketed to seconds from being delivered. I'm confident there are advertisements around the place where they put us as infants waiting to check that our earlobes recoil properly. And we've been marketed to every waking moment since. And Jesus says, there is another kingdom. And that kingdom, it's coming right in the midst of this kingdom. It's here now. It's slowly but surely displacing the kingdom of this world. It's a counterculture to the culture that describes the kingdom of which we were born servants. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for this kingdom, this coming kingdom of heaven belongs to them. What exactly do you mean by poor in spirit, Jesus? That's kind of an obscure reference. The rest of them are like meek. I get meek. I mean, I've heard a million preachers teach about meekness is power under control, but it means something. But poor in spirit, Jesus doesn't use a familiar idiom. He kind of makes one up. What's he getting at? My favorite author, Philip Yancey, in his wonderful book, The Jesus I Never Knew. If you want to pick up a book for some supplemental reading, I highly who is poor in spirit, has a peculiar advantage over the rest of us. And he goes on to enumerate. The poor, he writes, know their dependence on God. The poor rest their security, not on things, but on people. The poor have no exaggerated sense of their own importance. The poor can distinguish between necessities and luxuries. The poor can respond to the call of the gospel with a certain abandonment and uncomplicated totality. Therefore, in a very practical, non-esoteric way, the poor or those whose spirit has learned from the poor they are truly blessed. They can respond to the gospel with a certain uncomplicated totality. Now, those who are poor intrinsically receive that blessing, but there are more that have access to it. Those who are poor, yes, but what about those who are rich, which is most of us by global, even local, certainly historical standards. What hope is there for us? He says, for all of us, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those whose spirits have been modeled by, instructed by the poor. Those who have learned from the ways of the poor and learned to be like them in their inner life because they can respond with a certain uncomplicated totality where we in the kingdom of this world, can respond in totality to nothing, everything, all the time. All the management of the stuff and the processes, the dreams and the ambitions, the image that we are taught to manicure, it's a full-time job. And so we suffer from a syndrome of opportunity cost, to put it in economic terms. We can't go fully all in on anything because of what else we might let fall or what else we might be missing. The kids these days have apps for their apps and social media and adults too, right? That tell us in real time where everybody is that we know and exactly what they're doing. So we can't even enjoy the fun we're actually having because we also see what fun other people are doing and then feel, as the kids say, some type of way that we weren't invited to have that fun, even though our fun may be much more fun empirically than their fun. But they're having fun over there and they're having fun, but then they're posting pictures about their fun and nobody posts the pictures when they're feeling lonely and insecure because they didn't get picked for the team or someone didn't ask them to dance and they're on the sideline like, <gasps> click, hey world, here's me hating my life. Nobody posts that. They post a picture of themselves pretending to look the part. I'm so happy 17 times until I look convincing. I'm going to post that one. Wait, no, 12 more. Okay, number 
10 is the best one. I'm going to post that. So the rest of the world thinks what I'm trying to believe about myself, which is that I got it all down. Everybody else doing the same thing. I look at them. They seem to be pretending like they're having the happiest moment of their life. I must be the one who is the loser. So we can't even enjoy the moment we're in. And we wonder why our youth are experiencing epidemic levels of anxiety and depression. This is the world we've created for them. And friends, we must create another world. The kingdom of this world is always going to suck us in, promise us everything, leave us wanting, and ultimately kill, steal, and destroy. What it wants to do with our souls, it wants to do with the next generation as well. But Jesus said, not so the kingdom of heaven. I came that you'd have abundant, rich, overflowing life. As the summer wore on, the crisis got worse before it got better. You know, there's a certain 10 to 14 day hump on a mission trip. Most mission trips aren't longer than that. I had no idea I was signing up for like the mother of mission trips. I thought all mission trips were eight weeks long. And my friend was like, only the Mormons do that. And I'm like, I didn't know. I missed the, I didn't know that like ninth graders went for seven days to Mexico. I thought everybody went for eight weeks to East Africa with one change of clothes that I hated before I got there. You can imagine how much I was hating them seven weeks of wearing them later. And my hands, they didn't have anything compulsively to go to. And my mind, it didn't have anything obsessively to snap to. And my heart, it didn't have anything appealing to hang on. It was just me and Jesus, and them. But you know where that crisis landed? A calling. It was in week seven that I heard in the way that only you know, but you know that you know more than you know the chairs beneath you like you know. I knew that I heard God say to my heart, you're not going to do the things you think you're going to do, son. You're going to serve me for the rest of your life and you're going to love it. And I've had people say, well, good for you, but you're the pastor. You got lucky. God kind of, you got born with a silver spoon spiritually or the angel sprinkled some hear God dust over you. Maybe But I've also lived a lot of other days in my life that disprove that theory, like every other one. Maybe I heard it because of the crisis of simplicity that Jesus introduced me to. Maybe I heard it because I was more hearable. Maybe Jesus is always speaking, always inviting, always inspiring and directing and calling. We want more than anything to hear the voice of God, yet maybe Jesus is broadcasting. Maybe there was nothing special about that ground or that day or that country or continent or me there. Maybe it was simply the lack of all the clutter. but I know I never looked back. And I'm not sure I'd be doing this. And for all of the challenges of the last couple of years that have come with doing this and probably doing that too, I've never doubted and never felt unfulfilled. I've never not experienced in my adult life Jesus' rich abundance as I understand it. Maybe that would have been the case another way. But I think it was something about being able to hear. We'll wrap it up here. Jesus arrived at Peter's house, remember, at the start of this passage. His mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever, and Jesus touched her. He went up to her room, got with her for a minute, touched her, and he healed her. And then she made a meal, and he sat and ate with her and her family. And now Jesus had just come from the Sermon on the Mount. The crowds were following him. They were about to catch up, and later that evening, they seemed to have found him, driven him across the lake. 
He was probably tired after all that preaching on a mount to 5,000 people plus women and children without a sound system. I mean, after preaching to 500 people with a microphone, I want to go home and lie on the couch in the prone position and watch the Broncos. I can imagine Jesus was feeling it too. Because he's like, blessed are the poor. They're like, blessed are the what? Poor. You know, he had no sound system. How do you speak to 10,000 plus? I have no idea. Good, uh, good acoustics, maybe? I don't know. Okay, so he's like, Bro, my mother's sick. And she's like, yeah, you know, I do have to talk to a bunch of people. I got to heal some sick. I know there's some people with demons coming. Maybe I'll just go down to like the Marriott and, and like see your mom when she's well. Jesus goes in. The weight of the world, sin, salvation, and making all things new on his shoulders. And he goes up to Peter's wife's mom's room. And he says, how you feeling? Like, I'm so sorry. And he touches her and he heals her. And she makes dinner. And I can imagine he's in there like cutting the potatoes with her, hanging with her. And he sits and eats dinner together. Here's the point. In this passage, in the details, we can infer the why behind the way of Jesus. Uncluttered is undistracted. And undistracted is fully present to others. See, Jesus was the most fully present guy. How do you do that? How do you have that knowing that that's about to go down and that like a couple years down the road is that and still see Peter's mother-in-law? He was present everywhere he went. And he was able, I believe, to be fully present, not because he overrode his human nature with God-present capabilities, but because he chose a way that was uncluttered, that was undistracted. In our culture, we've made a, a series of apocryphal virtues, right, that have kind of replaced Judeo-Christian ethic Virtues, like in, in place of, of, of fidelity, we've put like um, authenticity. Nothing wrong with authenticity, but I mean, the, the opposition to hypocrisy is one of our national virtues. Everybody hates a hypocrite. We all love to come together and gang up on the, the preacher that was sleeping with the secretary or whatever. Like, and I get it. Um, or uh, anti-awkwardness. I mean, no awkwardness is safe in our society. We train them early. Like third graders know to say, awkward. And like, we avoid that thing. We'll go to great lengths to avoid anything awkward, right? Well, another one of those apocryphal national virtues, I think, is multitasking. We've created a beatitudes of our own, right? Blessed are the efficient because they grow the American economy and make the dream come true for themselves. Jesus, in the face of those headwinds, Jesus, I think, was like a serial single tasker. And I love that about him. He did one thing at a time. He never seemed to be bothered or pressured into doing whatever else for whatever other reason. He was fully present. But man, how our society, how the kingdom of this world, world teaches us from birth to value the stuff and the stuff we have to do. Yancey offered this observation, and we'll wrap it up here. The people we laud, he wrote, they strive to emulate and feature on the covers, the people we strive to emulate, rather, and feature on the covers of popular magazines are not the fulfilled, happy, balanced person's we might imagine. My career as a journalist has afforded me opportunities to interview stars, including NFL football greats, movie actors, music performers, best-selling authors, politicians, and TV personalities. These are the people who dominate the media. We fawn over them, pouring over the minutia of their lives. Yet I must tell you, he writes, that in my limited experience, I have found our idols are as miserable a group of people as I have ever met. 
Most have troubled or broken marriages. Nearly all are incurably dependent on psychotherapy. And in a heavy irony, these larger-than-life heroes seem tormented by self-doubt. Perhaps Jesus had the right of it. Blessed are the poor. The poor and those who embrace something of their spirit. Friends, we're not designed for stuff to fulfill us. Jesus said your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. He doesn't say your life shouldn't consist, but it can't. It's as if to say, I thought of you. I wrote your source code. I designed you. And take it from me, please. No stuff can fulfill you. It is the ultimate means to an end. If it is the end, it is going to let you down. We're designed for relationships to fulfill us. Relationship with our creator, who is a good and loving father, who has called you his daughter. He's called you his son. And he said, I have called you by name and you belong to me. Relationship with Jesus, the son, our savior. Relationship with the Holy Spirit, our counselor and advocate. Relationships with our friends, our family, our community, our church family, relationships in our neighborhoods, relationships with the people with whom we work who think Jesus is a joke or a swear word, but before whom we get to model his love. Relationships are what we are designed to have fulfill us. But friends, we give ourselves fully to so little because we're managing so much. Very little of which is intrinsically wrong. Like if you're managing a, you know, a porn collection, that's bad. But most of us are managing stuff that intrinsically is fine. It's amoral. It's neither bad nor good. It's the place that it asks for in our hearts. It's the fact that it wants to pull our strings like a puppet. So I believe Jesus, his way across the ages asks a couple of simple questions of us. First, what do you have or what do you do that consistently keeps you from being present to others? What stuff do you have or what thing do you do that regularly keeps you from being able to be present to others? And the second is why do you have it? Why do you do it? What is it fulfilling in you? What real need are you meeting in a tawdry, illicit way? Would you stand with me? It's time for us to go. Jesus, we want to follow you and be your disciples. We're amazed at your way. We probably know more of your truth. And at least I can say I find myself feeling self-conscious when I evaluate myself against what I'm seeing to be your way. Would you lead me in it? Would you lead us Would you lead my friends in your way this week? Lord, I bless them in their work, in their relationships, in their hearts. Lord, everything that they do this week, these are the things you've entrusted to them. Let them do with the strength you supply. Let them do in your name. Let them do your way. Fill everything, everywhere with yourself. Lord, whether they're traveling, selling, producing, incorporating, repairing, creating, whether they're studying and learning, whatever it is they do, whether they're training children, governing, adjudicating, healing, 
leading, directing, correcting, creating. Let them do it all in your name. Fill those avenues of enterprise with you through them. Let them shine with your love and show your way and take care of everything that's weighing them down, burdening them, keeping them from living fully. Lord, I bless them today as I know you do. I thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you, everybody. Have an amazing week. Thanks so much for coming to worship with us this day. Enjoy the beautiful Sunday, and we'll see you next week. We hope you've been encouraged this week. For more information or to submit a prayer request, go to denverunited.com.